Good afternoon. I'm very honored to speak with you today. As mentioned, I work with the Association for International Human Rights Reporting Standards, or FIRST, where our op operational office is in, in, based in Indonesia. While my organization tackles many human, uh, prevailing human rights issues that are in Indonesia, our primary focus is on business and human rights. It is partially through this lens that I hope to not only re reiterate the issues that we've discussed thus far, but offer a new element for us to consider. While the information I present is centered around Indonesia, I think many points remain relevant for most lower middle income countries. The right to health. The right to good health is enshrined in international human rights law and is codified in many of the laws and regulations around the world. But I think the right to health is not really the question we should be asking. The question I think we should be asking is whether we can realize the right to health in the face of economic disparities between nations and within peoples, between peoples. Also, can we face or solve the issue of health when we're facing global epidemics, such as non-communable diseases? In my humble opinion, the answer is yes. While we cannot solve the economic disparities overnight, we can address health in a different way. We must first realize the right to information and the right to um, science at minimum. If governments or if people are denied the right to information and the right to science, they are naturally denied the right to make their own decisions about their health. Without going into great detail about the allowances and limitations associated with the right to information, I start by saying that individuals have the right to seek receive and impart information and ideas without fear of discrimination or reprisal. This includes the freedom to, excuse me, to petition and obtain information of public information from government and public bodies, and the right to pe uh, people to access personal information. The process by which information may be disseminated may take many forms, but it is not solely a reactive or a demand and response process. Governments must also take a proactive approach in ensuring that information of public interest is disseminated to the public in a timely fashion. In many cases, especially in situations involving health, this is, involves ensuring that individuals are aware of advances in science. To promote the right to information, governments must understand how citizens consume and use information. How literate is the community? Do citizens take in all information without question or filter? How is information being disseminated? What role does culture play in how information is received? Governments cannot just take random action and hope something will stick. This requires research or engaging in the scientific process. In our work, we found this to be a problem in Indonesia. Information is not always shared in a timely manner. Other times, citizens are not filtering the information that they are receiving or verifying whether the information is fake news. For others, citizens are reluctant to question the government, and this may be due to fear of reprisal, or it may just simply be the natural instinct to believe that government will not harm us. The right to science. There seems to be two views of right to science. Both perspectives, in my opinion, are not wrong. One is simply more accurate. It is true that the right to science is often discussed in context of other rights. Even in my comments about the right to information, I could not avoid mentioning science. However, I think adopting this perspective without more consideration is diminutive. I suggest that the right to science, the right is, it suggests that the right to science is not important because it's not necessarily a basic needs right. 
like the right to shelter, the right to food, the right to water. But we can all agree that the right to science is a right in, in, in and of itself. It helps ensure that the sick have, the minim, have minimum access to conditions needed to prolong life. It ensures that societies have an opportunity to make informed decisions about their health. I can't stress enough that everyone has a right to science, but intentionally denying a right to science, the benefits of science and application is simply wrong. I'm not talking about um, countries that don't have enough money to engage in science, because I can appreciate that lower middle income co countries may not have the finances to engage in a full blown scientific endeavor. But saying things like, I don't want to be bothered in researching a product or it's not political, political for me is not an acceptable reason for science to not be in a government's agenda. Also, the rights to enjoy the benefits of science is not whether the country can engage in the science, but ensuring sci um, scientific innovation. This means not placing restrictive barriers on access to scientific information. Now, what this typically looks like is uh, taxing or creating regulations on a product that the wealthy can afford, but the poor cannot afford. And we've seen international cases where, for example, HIV drugs were available to the wealthy, but the poor was taxed out of it because they couldn't afford it. That is discrimination. And it may not be an intentional action, but it's still discrimination nonetheless. Earlier, I mentioned that the right to information and the right to science is one path to addressing global ep epidemics such as NCDs. So in the work that we were doing, we focused on NCDs because it's a significant issue in Indonesia. Since 1990, the communicable diseases have gone down. But while those are going down, non-communicable diseases are going up. And this may be tr uh, attributed to the move away from the farming lifestyle to a more sedentary lifestyle, also the introduction of Western trends, such as fast food, supermarket shopping, and increasing consumption of processed foods. So in addressing how the right to information and the right to science could potentially address these issues, uh, we focused on two of the four modifiable factors that increase the risk of NCDs, which is unhealthy diet and tobacco use. Specifically, we looked at the consumption of sodium, sugar, and tobacco. We then considered the potential alternative products that may reduce the risk of NCDs. And I won't go into detail of the products because they have already been introduced in previous lecture um, discussions, but I will stop and caution right here. It may be easy to say, well, if you want to stop a bad habit, just stop. But the reality of it is that maladaptive behavior cannot be resolved overnight. And particularly when we consider the issue of addiction, that is more than just a behavior. There's a psycho psychological issue involved, and there's also a biological issue involved. So we must look at harm reduction techniques or approaches that will address the issue. And by harm reduction, the psychological part that sticks with me is that we are meeting people where they are. So that doesn't mean that they will forever use the bad or do the bad thing. It's just that we will go at their pace and when they're able to transition, they will. So in looking at these less harmful, what we call less harmful products, we consider those products less harmful because they're seeking to reduce directly or indirectly the risk of NCDs, but they are not necessarily without detriment. So the products that we looked at may or may not cause physical harm, but the question is, does the benefits of these products outweigh the negative impact of these products? And what we, do, what we found in our study is that sodium, for example, it generally does what it's intended to do. It lowers blood pressure, um, it reduces the salt intake of consumers, and the only way it doesn't work is for people who have medical conditions that prohibit this. Now, sugar and tobacco is more controversial. Tobacco more so than sugar, but I think that's more of a political reason than r really facts. And what I mean by that is that tobacco has a, a bad history and a bad 
reputation, so nobody wants to listen to what they have to say, whereas sugar, they haven't had their time yet, but I, in my opinion, it will come. So what we found, though, and there's no consensus, is that with the sugar, the results are mixed. What they have not found was some people say that it causes diabetes-like diabetes -like, um, behavior in the body. Other studies say it doesn't. With tobacco, some people argue, well, we shouldn't trust it or the tobacco alternative products because there's no longitudinal studies or, you know, the, the research is biased. Our goal is not to advocate for a particular product, and we're solely no, in no position to um, affirmatively say that these products are effective or not. But we can advocate for the continued freedom to investigate the effectiveness and the safety of these products. So complete bans on technology is not an appropriate response when there is no evidence to, uh, that the product causes serious and irreversible harm. As is commonly accepted in the pharmaceutical industry, again, does the benefits out of the product outweigh the negative effects of using the product? This will take time. So I spend a lot of time, and we typically spend a lot of time, thinking about what government should do. But I would like to switch it a little bit and look at what businesses should do. When we look at the, the responsibility of states, yes, we can outline the, the state has a responsibility to, to protect. But the business industry also has a responsibility to respect human rights. This means mitigating the harms that they cause. That also means being proactive. It is no longer good for our businesses to not just do any harm. What they also must do is be proactive in engaging the community and the, well, the global community and solving global issues. So this may mean introducing products that are controversial and it also may mean that the producer of the, uh, the harmful product is also producing products that are supposed to tackle global issues. Does it make them less valid? No. I would like to think, yeah, okay, sure. They are trying to make a profit, their business, I get it. But the fact that they're introducing new products on the market does, make, does not make their contribution any less valuable. And a matter, as a matter of fact, their responsibility in some ways goes above and beyond what the state is doing. So even if the government refuses to honor human rights, a business must always honor their human rights. So I will conclude, just in the interest of time, with a couple recommendations, and I won't go through all of them, but these recommendations do come from perspective of what we found in Indonesia, but I do think that a lot of them would apply to lower middle income countries. Promote public engagement in sciences where possible. This could be simple as creating, helping creating a platform. So if you can't afford those big scientific endeavors, creating a platform that encourages um, scientists, social scientists to engage in the scientific process is a good start. Businesses themselves should be proactive. They should not wait for harm to come. They should also anticipate what is going on, not only in the global community, but what happens if something happens. And they should actively communicate this because businesses do get a bad rep of only being profit driven, but a lot of companies are doing things to address global issues and they need to communicate that to the world. And particularly, make sure that their research is available to academic, scientific, metal, and or medical communities. So, and they're available for inter, um, in, independent review. It is not enough to say, trust me, no. You have to show it and we should be able to challenge your work. And lastly, for governments, they should be able to be proactive in their lawmaking, meaning that don't look at narrowly at an issue and say we're going to create a re regulation on the issue. Let's think more broadly at unforeseen things. What are we going to do when an unforeseen issue comes up and how will we address it? And w by doing that, that should help create a balance in how we address 
uh, less harmful products and pro or scientific advancements in general. Thank you. Thank you, Tequila.